Section 12 There, too, not fastened to the wall like the little angels, but attached from the porch, of more than human stature, erect upon her pedestal as upon a footstool, which had been placed there to save her feet from contact with the wet ground, stood a saint with the full cheeks, the firm breasts which swelled out inside her draperies, like a cluster of ripe grapes inside a bag, the narrow forehead, short and stubborn nose, deep-set eyes, and strong, thick-skinned, courageous expression of the country women of those parts. This similarity, which imparted to the statue itself a kindliness that I had not looked to find in it, was corroborated often by the arrival of some girl from the fields, come, like ourselves, for shelter beneath the porch, whose presence there, as when the leaves of a climbing plant have grown up beside leaves carved in stone, seemed intended by fate to allow us, by confronting it with its type in nature, to form a critical estimate of the truth of the work of art. Before our eyes, in the distance, a promised or an accursed land, Rusenville, within whose walls I had never penetrated. Rusenville was now, when the rain had ceased for us, still being chastised, like a village in the Old Testament, by all the innumerable spears and arrows of the storm, which beat down obliquely upon the dwellings of its inhabitants, or else had already received the forgiveness of the Almighty, who had restored to it the light of his Son, which fell upon it in rays of uneven length, like the rays of a monstrance upon an altar. Sometimes, when the weather had completely broken, we were obliged to go home and to remain shut up indoors. Here and there, in the distance, in a landscape which, what with the failing light and saturated atmosphere, resembled a seascape rather, a few solitary houses clinging to the lower slopes of a hill, whose heights were buried in a cloudy darkness, shone out like little boats which had folded their sails and would ride at anchor all night upon the sea. But what mattered rain or storm? In summer, Bad weather is no more than a passing fit of superficial ill-temper expressed by the permanent, underlying fine weather, a very different thing from the fluid and unstable fine weather of winter. It's very opposite, in fact, for has it not, firmly established in the soil on which it has taken solid form in dense masses of foliage over which the rain may pour in torrents without weakening the resistance offered by their real and lasting happiness, hoisted, to keep them flying throughout the season, in the village streets, on the walls of the houses and in their gardens, its silken banners, violet and white. Sitting in the little parlour, where I would pass the time until dinner with a book, I might hear the water dripping from our chestnut trees, but I would know that the shower would only glaze and brighten the greenness of their thick, crumpled leaves, and that they themselves had undertaken to remain there, like pledges of summer, all through the rainy night, to assure me of the fine weather's continuing. It might rain as it pleased, but to-morrow, over the white fence of Tonsonville, there would surge and flow, numerous as ever, a sea of little heart-shaped leaves. And without the least anxiety, I could watch the poplar in the Rue des Perchamps, praying for mercy, bowing in desperation before the storm. Without the least anxiety, I could hear, at the far end of the garden, the last peals of thunder growling among our lilac trees. If the weather was bad all morning, my family would abandon the idea of a walk, and I would remain at home. But, later on, I formed the habit of going out by myself on such days, and walking towards Maiseglise la Vineuse, during that autumn when we had to come to Combray to settle the division of my Aunt Léonie's estate, for she had died at last, leaving both parties among her neighbours, triumphant in the fact of her demise. 
those who had insisted that her mode of life was enfeebling and must ultimately kill her, and equally, those who had always maintained that she suffered from some disease not imaginary, but organic, by the visible proof of which the most sceptical would be obliged to own themselves convinced, once she had succumbed to it. Causing no intense grief to any save one of her survivors, but to that one a grief savage in its violence. During the long fortnight of my aunt's last illness, Françoise never went out of her room for an instant, never took off her clothes, allowed no one else to do anything for my aunt, and did not leave her body until it was actually in its grave. Then, at last, we understood that the sort of terror in which Françoise had lived of my aunt's harsh words her suspicions and her anger, had developed in her a sentiment which we had mistaken for hatred, and which was really veneration and love. Her true mistress, whose decisions it had been impossible to foresee, from whose stratagems it had been so hard to escape, of whose good nature it had been so easy to take advantage, her sovereign, her mysterious and omnipotent monarch, was no more. Compared with such a mistress, we counted for very little. The time had long passed when, on our first coming to spend our holidays at Combray, we had been of equal importance, in Françoise's eyes, with my aunt. During that autumn, my parents, finding the days so fully occupied with the legal formalities that had been gone through, and discussions with solicitors and farmers, that they had little time for walks, which, as it happened, the weather made precarious, began to let me go, without them, along the Mesoglise Way, wrapped up in a huge highland plaid, which protected me from the rain, and which I was all the more ready to throw over my shoulders, because I felt that the stripes of its gaudy tartan scandalized Françoise, whom it was impossible to convince that the colour of one's clothes had nothing whatever to do with one's mourning for the dead, and to whom the grief which we had shown on my aunt's death was wholly unsatisfactory, since we had not entertained the neighbours to a great funeral banquet, and did not adopt a special tone when we spoke of her while I at times might be heard humming a tune. I am sure that in a book, and to that extent, my feelings were closely akin to those of Françoise. Such a conception of mourning, in the manner of the Chanson de Roland and of the porch of Saint-André-des-Champs, would have seemed most attractive. But the moment that Françoise herself approached, some evil spirit would urge me to attempt to make her angry, and I would avail myself of the slightest pretext to say to her that I regretted my aunt's death, because she had been a good woman, in spite of her absurdities, but not in the least because she was my aunt, that she might easily have been my aunt, and yet have been so odious that her death would not have caused me a moment's sorrow. Statements which, in a book, would have struck me as merely fatuous. And if Françoise then, inspired like a poet with a flood of confused reflections upon bereavement, grief, and family memories, were to plead her inability to rebut my theories, saying, I don't know how to express myself, I would triumph over her with an ironical and brutal common sense worthy of Dr. Pespier, and if she went on, all the same, she was a geological relation, there is always the respect due to your geology. I would shrug my shoulders and say, it is really very good of me to discuss the matter with an illiterate old woman who cannot speak her own language. Adopting to deliver judgment on Françoise, the mean and narrow outlook of the pedant. End of chapter 14
whom those who are most contemptuous of him, in the impartiality of their own minds, are only too prone to copy when they are obliged to play a part upon the vulgar stage of life. My walks that autumn were all the more delightful because I used to take them after long hours spent over a book. When I was tired of reading, after a whole morning in the house, I would throw my plaid across my shoulders and set out. My body, which in a long spell of enforced immobility had stored up an accumulation of vital energy, was now obliged, like a spinning top wound and let go, to spend this in every direction. The walls of houses, the Tonsonville hedge, the trees of Roussonville wood, the bushes against which Montjuvan leaned its back, all must bear the blows of my walking stick or umbrella, must hear my shouts of happiness, Blows and shouts being indeed no more than expressions of the confused ideas which exhilarated me, and which, not being developed to the point at which they might rest exposed to the light of day, rather than submit to a slow and difficult course of elucidation, found it easier and more pleasant to drift into an immediate outlet. And so it is, that the bulk of what appear to be the emotional renderings of our inmost sensations do no more than relieve us of the burden of those sensations by allowing them to escape from us in an indistinct form which does not teach us how it should be interpreted. When I attempt to reckon up all that I owe to the Mazaglise way, all the humble discoveries of which it was either the accidental setting or the direct inspiration and cause, I am reminded that it was in that same autumn, on one of those walks, near the bushy precipice which guarded Montjuvan from the rear, that I was struck for the first time by this lack of harmony between our impressions and their normal forms of expression. After an hour of rain and wind, against which I had put up a brisk fight, as I came to the edge of the Montjuvan pond, and reached a little hut, roofed with tiles, in which M. Vinteuil's gardener kept his tools. The sun shone out again, and its golden rays, washed clean by the shower, blazed once more in the sky, on the trees, on the wall of the hut, and on the still wet tiles of the roof, which had a chicken perching upon its ridge. The wind pulled out sideways the wild grass that grew in the wall, and the chicken's downy feathers, both of which things let themselves float upon the wind's breath to their full extent, with the unresisting submissiveness of light and lifeless matter. The tiled roof cast upon the pond, whose reflections were now clear again in the sunlight, a square of pink marble, the like of which I had never observed before, and, seeing upon the water, where it reflected the wall, a pallid smile responding to the smiling sky, I cried aloud in my enthusiasm, brandishing my furled umbrella, Damn! 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 But at the same time I felt that I was in duty bound not to content myself with these unilluminating words, but to endeavour to see more clearly into the sources of my enjoyment. And it was at that moment, too, thanks to a peasant who went past, apparently in a bad enough humour already, but more so when he nearly received my umbrella in his face, and who replied without any cordiality to my fine day, what, good to be out walking, that I learned that identical emotions do not spring up in the hearts of all men simultaneously, by pre-established order. Later on I discovered that, whenever I had read for too long, and was in a mood for conversation, the friend to whom I would be burning to say something would, at that moment, have finished indulging himself in the delights of conversation, and wanted nothing now but to be left to read undisturbed. And if I had been thinking with affection of my parents, and forming the most sensible and proper plans for giving them pleasure, they would have been using the same interval of time, to discover some misdeed that I had already forgotten, and would begin to scold me severely, just as I flung myself upon them with a kiss. 
sometimes to the exhilaration which I derived from being alone, would be added an alternative feeling, so that I could not be clear in my mind to which I should give the casting vote, a feeling stimulated by the desire to see rise up before my eyes a peasant girl whom I might clasp in my arms. Coming abruptly, and without giving me time to trace it accurately to its source among so many ideas of a very different kind, the pleasure which accompanied this desire seemed only a degree superior to what was given me by my other thoughts. I found an additional merit in everything that was in my mind at the moment, in the pink reflection of the tiled roof, the wild grass in the wall, the village of Roussenville, into which I had long desired to penetrate, the trees of its wood and the steeple of its church, created in them by this fresh emotion which made them appear more desirable only because I thought it was they that had provoked it, and which seemed only to wish to bear me more swiftly towards them when it filled my sails with a potent, unknown, and propitious breeze. But if this desire that a woman should appear added for me something more exalting than the charms of nature, they in their turn enlarged what I might, in the woman's charm, have found too much restricted. It seemed to me that the beauty of the trees was hers also, and that, as for the spirit of those horizons, of the village of Roussenville, of the books which I was reading that year, it was her kiss which would make me master of them all, and my imagination drawing strength from contact with my sensuality, my sensuality expanding through all the realms of my imagination, my desire had no longer any bounds. Moreover, just as in moments of musing contemplation of nature, the normal actions of the mind being suspended, and our abstract ideas of things set on one side, we believe with the profoundest faith in the originality, in the individual existence of the place in which we may happen to be. The passing figure which my desire evoked seemed to be not any one example of the general type of woman, but a necessary and natural product of the soil. For at that time everything which was not myself, the earth and the creatures upon it, seemed to me more precious, more important, endowed with a more real existence than they appear to full-grown men and between the earth and its creatures I made no distinction. I had a desire for a peasant girl from Maiseglise or Roussenville, for a fisher girl from Baalbec, just as I had a desire for Baalbec and Maiseglise. The pleasure which those girls were empowered to give me would have seemed less genuine. I should have had no faith in it any longer, if I had been at liberty to modify its conditions as I chose to meet in Paris a fisher-girl from Baalbec, or a peasant-girl from Maiseglise, would have been like receiving the present of a shell, which I had never seen upon the beach, or of a fern, which I had never found among the woods, would have stripped from the pleasure which she was about to give me all those other pleasures in the thick of which my imagination had enwrapped her. But to wander thus, among the woods of Roussenville, without a peasant girl to embrace, was to see those woods, and yet know nothing of their secret treasure, their deep hidden beauty. That girl, whom I never saw, save dappled with the shadows of their leaves, was to me herself a plant of local growth, only taller than the rest and one whose structure would enable me to approach more closely than in them, to the intimate savour of the land from which she had sprung. I could believe this all the more readily, and also that the caresses by which she would bring that savour to my senses were themselves of a particular kind, yielding a pleasure which I could never derive from any but herself. Since I was still, and must for long remain, in that period of life when one has not yet separated the fact of this sensual pleasure from the various women in whose company one has tasted it. 
when one has not reduced it to a general idea, which makes one regard them thenceforward as the variable instruments of a pleasure that is always the same. Indeed, that pleasure does not exist, isolated and formulated in the consciousness, as the ultimate object with which one seeks a woman's company, or as the cause of the uneasiness which, in anticipation, one then feels. Hardly even does one think of oneself, but only how to escape from oneself. Obscurely awaited, imminent and concealed, it rouses to such a paroxysm, at the moment when at last it makes itself felt, those other pleasures which we find in the tender glance, in the kiss of her who is by our side, that it seems to us, more than anything else, a sort of transport of gratitude for the kindness of heart of our companion, and for her touching predilection of ourselves, which we measure by the benefits, by the happiness that she showers upon us. Alas, it was in vain that I implored the dungeon-keep of Roussainville, that I begged it to send out to meet me some daughter of its village, appealing to it as to the sole confidant to whom I had disclosed my earliest desires when, from the top floor of our house at Combray, from the little room that smelt of orris root, I had peered out, and seen nothing but its tower, framed in the square of the half-opened window, while, with the heroic scruples of a traveller setting forth for unknown climes, or of a desperate wretch hesitating on the verge of self-destruction, faint with emotion, I explored, across the bounds of my own experience, an untrodden path which, I believed, might lead me to my death even, until, Passion spent itself, and left me shuddering among the sprays of flowering current which, creeping in through the window, tumbled all about my body. In vain I called upon it now. In vain I compressed the whole landscape into my field of vision, draining it with an exhaustive gaze which sought to extract from it a female creature. I might go alone as far as the porch of saint andre des champs Never did I find there the girl whom I should inevitably have met, had I been with my grandfather, and so unable to engage her in conversation. I would fix my eyes, without limit of time, upon the trunk of a distant tree, from behind which she must appear and spring towards me. My closest scrutiny left the horizon barren as before. Night was falling. Without any hope now would I concentrate my attention as though to force up out of it the creatures which it must conceal upon that sterile soil, that stale and outworn land, and it was no longer in lightness of heart, but with sullen anger that I aimed blows at the trees of Roussainville wood, from among which no more living creatures made their appearance than if they had been trees painted on the stretched canvas background of a panorama when, unable to resign myself to having to return home without having held in my arms the woman I so greatly desired, I was yet obliged to retrace my steps towards Combray, and to admit to myself that the chance of her appearing in my path grew smaller every moment. And if she had appeared, would I have dared to speak to her? I felt that she would have regarded me as mad, for I no longer thought of those desires which came to me on my walks, but were never realised, as being shared by others, or as having any existence apart from myself. They seem nothing more now than the purely subjective, impotent, illusory creatures of my temperament. They were in no way connected now with nature, with a world of real things, which from now onwards lost all its charm and significance, and meant no more to my life than a purely conventional framework, just as the action of a novel is framed in the railway carriage, on a seat of which a traveller is reading it, to pass the time. And it is, perhaps, from another impression, which I received at Montjuvin, some years later, an impression which, at that time, was without meaning, that there arose, long afterwards, my idea of that cruel side of human passion 
called sadism. We shall see in due course that for quite another reason the memory of this impression was to play an important part in my life. It was during a spell of very hot weather. My parents, who had been obliged to go away for the whole day, had told me that I might stay out as late as I pleased, and having gone as far as the Montjuvan Pond, where I enjoyed seeing again the reflection of the tiled roof of the hut, I had lain down in the shade and gone to sleep among the bushes on the steep slope that rose up behind the house, just where I had waited for my parents years before, one day when they had gone to call on Monsieur Vinteuil. It was almost dark when I awoke, and I wished to rise and go away, but I saw Mademoiselle Vinteuil, or thought at least that I recognized her, for I had not seen her often at Combray, and then only when she was still a child, when she was now growing into a young woman, who probably had just come in, standing in front of me, and only a few feet away from me, in that room in which her father had entertained mine, and which she had now made into a little sitting-room for herself. The window was partly open, the lamp was lighted, I could watch her every movement without her being able to see me. But, had I gone away, I must have made a rustling sound among the bushes. She would have heard me, and might have thought that I had been hiding there in order to spy upon her. She was in deep mourning, for her father had but lately died. We had not gone to see her. My mother had not cared to go, on account of that virtue which alone in her fixed any bounds to her benevolence, namely modesty. But she pitied the girl from the depths of her heart. My mother had not forgotten the sad end of M. Vinteuil's life, his complete absorption, first in having to play both mother and nursery maid to his daughter, and later in the suffering which she had caused him. She could see the tortured expression which was never absent from the old man's face in those terrible last years. She knew that he had definitely abandoned the task of transcribing in fair copies the whole of his later work, the poor little pieces, we imagined, of an old music-master, a retired village organist, which, we assumed, were of little or no value in themselves, though we did not despise them, because they were of such great value to him, and had been the chief motive of his life, before he sacrificed them to his daughter. Pieces which, being mostly not even written down, but recorded only in his memory, while the rest were scribbled on loose sheets of paper, and quite illegible, must now remain unknown for ever. My mother thought, also, of that other and still more cruel renunciation to which M. Vinteuil had been driven, that of seeing the girl happily settled, with an honest and respectable future. When she called to mind all this utter and crushing misery that had come upon my aunt's old music-master, she was moved to very real grief, and shuddered to think of that other grief, so different in its bitterness, which Mademoiselle Vinteuil must now be feeling, tinged with remorse at having virtually killed her father. Poor Monsieur Vinteuil, my mother would say, he lived for his daughter, and now he has died for her, without getting his reward. Will he get it now, I wonder, and in what form? It can only come to him from her. At the far end of Mademoiselle Vinteuil's sitting-room, on the mantelpiece, stood a small photograph of her father, which she went briskly to fetch, just as the sound of carriage-wheels was heard from the road outside, then flung herself down on a sofa, and drew close beside her a little table on which she placed the photograph, just as, long ago, M. Vinteuil had placed beside him the piece of music which he would have liked to play over to my parents. And then her friend came in. Mademoiselle Vinteuil greeted her without rising, clasping her hands behind her head, and drew her body to one side of the sofa, as though to make room 
But no sooner had she done this than she appeared to feel that she was perhaps suggesting a particular position to her friend, with an emphasis which might well be regarded as importunate. She thought that her friend would prefer, no doubt, to sit down at some distance from her, upon a chair. She felt that she had been indiscreet. Her sensitive heart took fright. Stretching herself out again over the whole of the sofa, she closed her eyes and began to yawn, so as to indicate that it was a desire to sleep, and that alone which had made her lie down there. Despite the rude and hectoring familiarity with which she treated her companion, I could recognize in her the obsequious and reticent advances, the abrupt scruples and restraints which had characterized her father. Presently she rose and came to the window, where she pretended to be trying to close the shutters, and not succeeding. "'Leave them open,' said her friend. "'I am hot. But it's too dreadful. People will see us.' Mademoiselle Vantoy answered, and then she guessed, probably, that her friend would think that she had uttered these words simply in order to provoke a reply in certain other words, which she seemed, indeed, to wish to hear spoken, but, from prudence, would let her friend be the first to speak. And so, although I could not see her face clearly enough, I am sure that the expression must have appeared on it which my grandmother had once found so delightful, when she hastily went on, When I say, see us, I mean, of course, see us reading. It's so dreadful to think that in every trivial little thing you do, someone may be overlooking you. With the instinctive generosity of her nature, a courtesy beyond her control, she refrained from uttering the studied words which, she had felt, were indispensable from the full realization of her desire, and perpetually, in the depths of her being, a shy and suppliant maiden would kneel before that other element, the old campaigner, battered but triumphant, would intercede with him, and oblige him to retire. Oh yes, it is so extremely likely that people are looking at us, at this time of night, in this densely populated district said her friend with bitter irony. And what if they are? she went on, feeling bound to annotate with a malicious yet affectionate wink, these words which she was repeating, out of good nature, like a lesson prepared beforehand, which, she knew, it would please Mademoiselle Van Toy to hear. And what if they are? All the better that they should see us. Mademoiselle Van Toy shuddered and rose to her feet. In her sensitive and scrupulous heart, she was ignorant what words ought to flow spontaneously from her lips, so as to produce the scene for which her eager senses clamoured. She reached out as far as she could, across the limitations of her true character, to find the language appropriate to a vicious young woman, such as she longed to be thought. But the words which, she imagined, such a young woman might have uttered with sincerity, sounded unreal in her own mouth and what little she allowed herself to say was said in a strained tone, in which her ingrained timidity paralysed her tendency to freedom and audacity of speech, while she kept on interrupting herself with, You're sure you aren't cold? You aren't too hot? You don't want to sit and read by yourself? Your ladyship's thoughts seem to be rather warm this evening, she concluded, doubtless repeating a phrase which she had heard used on some earlier occasion by her friend. In the V-shaped opening of her creep bodice, Mademoiselle Van Toy felt the sting of her friend's sudden kiss. She gave a little scream and ran away, and then they began to chase one another about the room, scrambling over the furniture, their wide sleeves fluttering like wings, clucking and crowing like a pair of amorous fowls. At last Mademoiselle Van Toy fell down exhausted upon the sofa, where she was screened from me by the stooping body of her friend. But the latter now had her back turned to the little table on which the old music-master's portrait had been arranged. Mademoiselle Van Toy realised that her friend would not see it unless her attention were drawn to it, and so exclaimed, as if she herself had just noticed it for the first time, "'Oh, there's my father's picture looking at us. I can't think who can have put it there. 
I'm sure I've told them twenty times that is not the proper place for it. I remembered the words that Monsieur Vinteuil had used to my parents in apologising for an obtrusive sheet of music. This photograph was, of course, in common use in their ritual observances, was subjected to daily profanation, for the friend replied in words which were evidently a liturgical response. Let him stay there. He can't trouble us any longer. Do you think he'd start whining? Do you think he'd pack you out of the house if he could see you now, with the window open, the ugly old monkey? To which Mademoiselle Vontoy replied, Oh, please, a gentle reproach which testified to the genuine goodness of her nature. Not that it was prompted by any resentment at hearing her father spoken of in this fashion, for that was evidently a feeling which she had trained herself, by a long course of sophistries, to keep in close subjection at such moments, but rather because it was the bridle which, so as to avoid all appearance of egotism, she herself used to curb the gratification which her friend was attempting to procure for her. It may well have been, too, that the smiling moderation with which she faced and answered these blasphemies, that this tender and hypocritical rebuke appeared to her frank and generous nature as a particularly shameful and seductive form of that criminal attitude towards life which she was endeavouring to adopt. But she could not resist the attraction of being treated with affection by a woman who had just shown herself so implacable towards the defenceless dead. She sprang onto the knees of her friend and held out a chaste brow to be kissed, precisely as a daughter would have done to her mother feeling with exquisite joy that they would thus, between them, inflict the last turn of the screw of cruelty, in robbing Monsieur Vinteuil, as though they were actually rifling his tomb, of the sacred rites of fatherhood. Her friend took the girl's head in her hands, and placed a kiss on her brow, with a docility prompted by the real affection she had for Mademoiselle Vinteuil, as well as by the desire to bring what distraction she could, into the dull and melancholy life of an orphan. "'Do you know what I should like to do to that old horror?' she said, taking up the photograph. She murmured in Mademoiselle Vinteuil's ear, something that I could not distinguish. "'Oh, you would never dare! Not dare to spit on it! On that!' shouted the friend with deliberate brutality. I heard no more, for Mademoiselle Vinteuil, who now seemed weary, awkward, preoccupied, sincere and rather sad, came back to the window and drew the shutters close. But I knew now what was the reward that Monsieur Vinteuil, in return for all the suffering that he had endured in his lifetime on account of his daughter, had received from her after his death. And yet, I have since reflected that if Monsieur Vinteuil had been able to be present at this scene, he might still, and in spite of everything, have continued to believe in his daughter's soundness of heart, and that he might even, in so doing, have been not altogether wrong. It was true that in all Mademoiselle Vinteuil's actions the appearance of evil was so strong and so consistent that it would have been hard to find it exhibited in such completeness, save in what is nowadays called a sadist. It is behind the footlights of a Paris theatre, and not under the homely lamp of an actual country house, that one expects to see a girl leading her friend on to spit upon the portrait of her father, who has lived and died for nothing and no one but herself. And when we find in real life a desire for melodramatic effect, it is generally the sardic instinct that is responsible for it. It is possible that, without being in the least inclined towards sadism, a girl might have shown the same outrageous cruelty as Mademoiselle Vinteuil in desecrating the memory and defying the wishes of her dead father, but she would not have given them deliberate expression in an act so crude in its symbolism, so lacking in subtlety. The criminal element in her behaviour would have been less evident to other people, and even to herself, since she would not have admitted to herself that she was doing wrong. But appearances apart, in Mademoiselle Vinteuil's soul 
at least in the earlier stages, the evil element was probably not unmixed. A sadist of her kind is an artist in evil, which a wholly wicked person could not be, for in that case the evil would not have been external, it would have seemed quite natural to her, and would not even have been distinguishable from herself. And as for virtue, respect for the dead, filial obedience, since she would never have practised the cult of these things, she would take no impious delight in their profanation. Sadists, of Mademoiselle Van Toy's sort, are creatures so purely sentimental, so virtuous by nature, that even sensual pleasure appears to them as something bad, a privilege reserved for the wicked. And when they allow themselves for a moment to enjoy it, they endeavour to impersonate, to assume all the outward appearance of wicked people, for themselves and their partners in guilt, so as to gain the momentary illusion of having escaped beyond the control of their own gentle and scrupulous natures into the inhuman world of pleasure. And I could understand how she must have longed for such an escape when I realised that it was impossible for her to effect it. At the moment when she wished to be thought the very antithesis of her father, what she at once suggested to me were the mannerisms, in thought and speech, of the poor old music-master. Indeed, his photograph was nothing. What she really desecrated, what she corrupted into ministering to her pleasures, but what remained between them and her, and prevented her from any direct enjoyment of them, was the likeness between her face and his, his mother's blue eyes which she had handed down to her, like some trinket to be kept in the family, those little friendly movements and inclinations which set up between the viciousness of Mademoiselle Van Toy and herself a phraseology, a mentality not designed for vice, which made her regard it as not in any way different from the numberless little social duties and courtesies to which she must devote herself every day. It was not evil that gave her the idea of pleasure, that seemed to her attractive. It was pleasure, rather, that seemed evil. And as, every time that she indulged in it, pleasure came to her attended by evil thoughts such as, ordinarily, had no place in her virtuous mind, she came at length to see in pleasure itself something diabolical, to identify it with evil. Perhaps Mademoiselle Ventoy felt that at heart her friend was not altogether bad, nor really sincere when she gave vent to those blasphemous utterances. At any rate, she had the pleasure of receiving those kisses on her brow, those smiles, those glances, all feigned perhaps, but akin in their base and vicious mode of expression to those which would have been discernible on the face of a creature formed not out of kindness and long-suffering, but out of self-indulgence and cruelty. She was able to delude herself for a moment into believing that she was indeed amusing herself in the way in which, with so unnatural an accomplice, a girl might amuse herself who really did experience that savage antipathy towards her father's memory. Perhaps she would not have thought of wickedness as a state so rare, so abnormal, so exotic, one which it was so refreshing to visit, had she been able to distinguish in herself, as in all her fellow men and women, that indifference to the sufferings which they cause, which, whatever names else be given it, is the one true, terrible, and lasting form of cruelty. End of section 12